I'm Walter Cronkite. This is the story of a jet carrier of one day in her life. The ship, the planes, the men, the mission. As the Prudential Insurance Company of America Century. coming into the slot for a jet landing on the USS Forrestal with the 6th Fleet somewhere in the Mediterranean. You have throttled down to 150 miles an hour. You are the pilot, and this is how it looks. now on the forest stall, five city blocks long, almost a football field wide. You could comfortably nest the liners Queen Elizabeth and United States on her flight deck. Stand the forest stall on end, and she would tower over the Empire State Building. Her crew is almost as large as the average American town, 3,500. You are piloting one of her thousand mile an hour plus planes. In a moment, this story, Jet Carrier. came into its own in World War II, superseded the now obsolete battleship as our big punch. Today, guided missiles and nuclear weapons have put the carrier at the crossroads, made it a controversial ship. Some experts, both in the West and East, say the carrier is finished, gone the way of the battle wagon. Nikita Khrushchev has said that Russia has weapons that can turn these ships of the Sixth Fleet into coffins of molten steel. We asked Rear Admiral C.D. Griffin on the Forrestal about that. Well, my reaction to that offhand, uh, Mr. Cronkite, is baloney. However, it is interesting to note the interest which Mr. Khrushchev places in the Sixth Fleet. The principal mission of naval forces is to control the seas, to have the seas available to our use and in time of war to deny these seas to an enemy. The aircraft carrier is and always will be a flexible, versatile, and moving air base. The jet attack carrier and the Polaris submarine combine as the greatest one-two punch in world history. This is the bridge, nerve center of the mighty ship. The helmsman uses this wheel, probably the ultimate in power steering. Captain Alan M. Shin, the Forrestal skipper, gets briefed. Johnny, what are we going to have for this uh, 1630 launch? We're definitely What's set now. On that? We're definitely set now on two A3Ds, four FAUs, and three A4Ds. This launch will definitely go at 1630, Captain. Right. Below deck in the ready room, a squadron intelligence officer briefs his pilot. Instead of having 33 long-range strike missions, the launch point will be in the Ionian Sea, 39 north, 19 degrees east. Therefore, you can see that most of the missions, especially missions like London, probably up Copenhagen and so forth, will be quite long-range missions, and it will behoove you to plan your fuel and cruise control very carefully. I'd like you to note from this chart here that we have a simulated line of enemy territory, the blue line. 
Beyond this line is simulated enemy held. You'll note also that we have drawn in some radar coverage points. Now you can expect to be intercepted after you pass this radar line about 120 miles, assuming that the enemy picks you up on the radar and does send fighters after you. The target assignment for each individual crew will be posted in approximately two hours from now. The planes are brought up from the hangar deck and readied for the strike. Four giant elevators do the job. The Forrestal's 100 planes run from single-jet, single-seat fighters and short-range bombers called Skyhawks, Demons, and Crusaders to huge twin-jet Sky Warrior bombers which carry three men and have a range of 3,000 miles. The crew of one of these, codenamed Bearcat 12, now gets its final briefing. Now, Commander Tully, your assigned target, as you can see from the charts here, is London. Now, the most desirable track for you to take from the launch point here would naturally be around the radar screen. However, your fuel consideration and distance and so forth will make it necessary for you to go almost direct. We have chosen a tentative ITP for you of Rouen in France, and if you approve of that, then we'll go ahead and uh, brief you on the various aspects of the mission. Does your charts indicate sufficient radar return in the Rouen area to use as an initial point? Uh, yes, sir, it does. Now, Art, you'll be more interested in this on your run into London there. We are not giving you any scope photography on this on purpose so that you will gain the, the training of not having it as you might on a regular target. Instead, we have prepared for you a hand prediction of what London should look like on your radar scope. Your target is right here, and it's a, an industrial complex within the city. This should break out very nicely, and you should be able to put your crosshairs on it and make it very well, fine. Bottom. Break out, yeah. Or it should break out at about 30 miles, I should imagine. Should be no strain whatsoever. Now the planes are armed for the mission. Included in the jet's arsenal are five-inch rockets for air-to-ground strafing. For air-to-air -air combat, the planes are equipped with the Sidewinder missile. An infrared device enables this missile to follow the heat trail of an enemy plane, track it, literally ride up its tailpipe to destroy it. The air boss in primary flight, high in the island above the flight deck, prepares for the launch. This is the ship's vital purpose, its reason for being, and a vast electronic and communications network is tied into it. Uh, ready one there, Ops. Ready one, aye. Uh, we have your lineup, have the pilot fan planes, over. Ready one, aye. Escalators carry pilots from the ready room to the flight deck. Otherwise, they claim, they'd be too tired to fly. Each plane may have a different mission from 3,000-mile practice atomic strikes to short-range delivery of dummy atomic shapes. There is also combat air patrol, a vital job, in which 1,000-mile-an-hour planes guard the ship itself from possible attack. helicopter, known to every pilot as the Angel, hovers off the flight deck during the entire operation, ready for pilot rescue from the sea. Check wing lines, wheel chocks, tie downs, all loose gear about the jets. Stand by to start the jets.
planes are now in condition one, ready to go as soon as they get the signal from the catapult officer. Like a slingshot, the steam catapult sends them hurtling on their way. Bearcat 12 takes off for its practice strike over London. raised hydraulically from the deck, protects men and equipment from the jet blast. missions are high altitude or long range. An A-4D Skyhawk, smallest jet combat attack plane in the world, zooms over a North African practice target. In its belly, a dummy atomic shape. Its drop altitude is so low that the pilot must toss bomb with a maneuver known as an idiot loop to avoid being destroyed by the blast of his own bomb. Meanwhile, Bearcat 12, already past the initial point, Rouen in France, completes the climb to drop altitude and notifies London of her approach. In the city of 8 million, only British and American air officers know of Bearcat 12. A strategic air command ground unit begins tracking it on its radar scope. Bearcat 12, now less than 50 miles away, is locked on target. A radar-controlled stylus tracks her route. At bombs away, this stylus will fall, showing exactly, with radar precision, where the bomb would have dropped. Back in the Mediterranean, the Forrestal waits for her returning brood of jets, the most tense moment an aircraft carrier experiences. The planes are no longer guided in by the waving paddles of a landing signal officer. The pilot now follows a mirror landing system. 
by keeping a reflected light called the meatball centered on this landing deck mirror, he maintains a perfect glide angle coming in. But the landing signal officer is still a busy man. Uh, there goes pitching. All down, clear deck. lowers the ceiling and makes visual landing hazardous, a small room below decks comes alive for an operation known as carrier controlled approach. This is practiced all the time, in good weather as well as in bad. Bearcat 12, returning from London, has just been picked up by radar and is talked down to a safe landing. Bearcat 12, port. 
130, final bearing. Bearcat 12, four miles. Bearcat 12, three miles. Port 130, final bearing. Check gear, flaps, hook, and light steady bright. Bearcat 12, two miles, on the center line. Bearcat 12, a mile and an eight. Commence landing rate of descent, report to meatball. All down, clear deck. Now, what was your time of uh, simulated drop? Simulated drop time was 18.06. Now, at any time during this flight, Captain, were you intercepted by any jet fighters? No, we saw what appeared to be some uh, French Mystère fighters in the vicinity of Rouen, but uh, we were not intercepted. What altitude did you fly from the ship to the simulated enemy territory? We uh, climbed to 38,000 uh, right after takeoff and maintained 38,000 until uh, we reached the initial point, uh, which, as we said before, was uh, Rouen. Right. And then what altitude did you use from Rouen to the target? Uh, we climbed from 38 to 45,000 over the target. I see. Then your drop altitude was 45? 45,000, that's correct. I see. Now, Art, I'd like to ask you a few questions about the uh, radar run. Uh, did you have any difficulty in identifying the target there in London on your radar? No. Well, London boomed in loud, strong, all the way, except that the particular target didn't actually come in until about uh, 20 miles. We reached about 35. It actually didn't come in until about 20. Did the uh, radar scope picture look a great deal like the hand prediction which you were given before your flight? Yes, the only thing is uh, I had never realized the size of London. Uh, very covered it, by it is scope. a tremendous, yeah. tremendous area. Now, uh, in your opinion, was your attack successful or unsuccessful? Well, my bombardier says it was a perfect run. I see. <laughs> the men of Bearcat 12 will sleep soon but they will sleep to the explosive sound of firing catapults and the shriek of jets being hurled into the Mediterranean night. The men of the forest all put it this way. A day aboard a jet carrier does not end. It simply continues.